Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Franny Everhart. I'm president of Friends of the Upper East Side. I'm delighted to welcome a very large audience to this presentation. Many of you are regular customers and we're glad to see you back. And for those of you who are new to us and to the organization, we are an organization founded in 1982 and we are dedicated to the architectural legacy, the livability and the sense of place of the Upper East Side. Um, our speaker today is Gary Lawrence talking about uh, the great mansions, the, the golden age mansions of, of Manhattan, uh, Fifth Avenue. That's an architectural legacy that exists uh, more in memory than in fact, but there are some uh, mansions still standing. You're going to hear more about some of the many uh, that aren't. One mansion uh, that should stand out in everyone's mind or all you preservationists who are on the Zoom tonight is the Brokaw Mansion. And its loss was uh, something that really finally precipitated the passage of the landmarks law. It had been kicking around in the city council, never reaching the mayor's desk until the Brokaw Mansion, which had been threatened and people had fought for it, uh, was torn down in, uh, in 64. And the landmarks law was finally passed in April of 65. So we're coming up on that anniversary and the memory of that lost mansion. And Gary Lawrence is gonna take take us on this cold, dark night in, in January. I can't think of a more wonderful place to, to go than some of the wonderful mansions of uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, Gary is an architect. Uh, he specializes in uh, 3D pre presentations, presentations of various kinds, models, 3D presentations, things like that. Really wonderful stuff. But his passion clearly is this topic. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from him about it. Uh, you, He has written about it. He's a, he blogs on the subject. So. Uh, you have a real, a very knowledgeable uh, treat coming, coming up here. And you will have a link to his book uh, as well, The Houses of the Hamptons, if you want more. I uh, will make that available to you as well. So Gary, the, the floor is yours. And uh, please take us back to Mrs. Astor and all of these uh, wonderful other nations. Well, thank you, Franny. And I want to you know, thank also Lara. And, and I'm so happy to be able to speak for the um, you know, the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. And I'm glad you mentioned the Brokaw House because I will briefly speak about that. And um, so what I enjoy doing with these talks is um, is showing the, the sad past of what is not there because so many people go through New York every day or visit and don't realize when you walk up and down Fifth Avenue, except for maybe Upper Fifth Avenue, which is now of course lined with beautiful apartment buildings, but mostly all those very, very you know prestigious apartment buildings replace very um, ornate and beautiful mansions, which sadly only lasted maybe 20 to 30 years. So I'm gonna start off with a, a beginning talk of moving up Fifth Avenue before we get to the three primary houses that I'm going to be talking about. And we'll take a look back into the past. So let me um, share my screen. Oh, also for those who um, don't know, I also um, am the um, creator of Mansions of the Gilded Age on Instagram and Facebook and the Gilded Age Society on Facebook and Instagram. So uh, if you want to follow me there too afterwards, I always post more information for that. Okay, so here we go and let's see how uh, we do. All right, we got through that technical difficulty there. So I'm um, going to have this is the opening slide and we're going to uh, talk primarily about these three houses. Yeah, can you imagine that these all once existed on Upper Fifth Avenue and, um, you know, aren't there anymore, but we're going to go back to a little bit earlier. So for those who are familiar with um, Gilded Age New York, and probably those who, um, even if you're not, but you've probably heard of the famous Mrs. Astor of the 400. She was, you know, um, supposedly the, the, the self-proclaimed queen of a New York society at that time and considered the queen of all uh, all American society, but of course it was only New York. That was a place where it was the ultimate. And so I always like to start this little uh, slideshow out with, um, here we have two houses. We have Mrs. Astor, who I just said is the, uh, was the, you know, one of the richest families in New York and um, you know, so-called queen of society who ran things who you certainly had to be uh, friends with or wanted to be friends with to be admitted to all the right parties and clubs and balls and so on. And then you have another house, which is quite elaborate, a second French empire mansion there. 
So um, I always joke about, well, I mean, Mrs. Astor lived in the house on the left, which in the time when it was built about the 1870s was considered a handsome, sturdy, proud house, you know, old uh, New York money, you know, Knickerbocker Society. And Mrs. Astor was from old New York money. The Astor family that she married into, they, they had made their money in like fur trapping and um, other things that made great fortunes in the Gilded Age. So they merged and she had a social background and, and he had the money. So, and on the house on the right is actually the home of A.T. Stewart, who was a, a merchant. He had the biggest department store in New York City. And uh, he was extremely wealthy too. Maybe not as rich as the Astros, but extremely wealthy. And a lot of the show is all about um, showing off their money. And like I said, in the um, Astor period, your homes were really meant to be uh, simple on the outside, not showy, but the interiors is where you spent all the money and all the opulence. So we're gonna take a quick look at Mrs. Astor's house here first. And as you can see, it is, um, it was a large house. If you look at the people in the slides, you can see it's, it's a very tall, they all had really very high ceiling heights. Uh, along the back of the slide there, you see a, a boxy building. That is the, um, the ballroom. Many of these houses had ballrooms. Um, the Gilded Age millionaires did not entertain in um, you know, hotels and things that, um, you know, catering halls or places like we often do take with most people, no matter how wealthy you are, don't, you don't have your own ballroom anymore. So, and that's okay. But in Mrs. Astor's time, you, you entertained a home and you really, very, really, really went after restaurants because, or you just ate at other people's houses that were, of, you know, of the society. But of course, you know, um, American is not royal. It's just regular people who came here didn't want to be um, royalty. But as soon as people started to acquire a great deal of money, they all wanted to become the new kings and queens of, of America. So many of the your um, American Gilded Age wealthy went to Europe a lot and they brought back furnishings and they kind of wanted to take on the, uh, the feeling that they were you know, American aristocracy. So here we have a painting of Mrs. Astor and her family in the drawing room and the house I just showed you on the outside, which doesn't look like that house would have such grand rooms. This is the um, first ballroom that Mrs. Astor had. And um, while it doesn't look too big here, if you look at the ceiling heights and you look at all the paintings, uh, throughout the show, we'll, we'll see a lot of paintings that are all hung in this sort of salon style stack. You wonder how uh, you view them because today, you know, we view pictures like I've met individually, but this was the style to clad your walls with as much art as you could put together. Uh, most of the houses had huge chandeliers. This chandelier, we're not gonna get into too much detail. I talk about this on my, in my larger Fifth Avenue show, but um, Mrs. Astor was very good about reusing things as she changed houses. So we're gonna see this large chandelier travel a bit during the time. And like I said, this was supposedly where Ward McAllister, who was a social uh, you know, courtier of the uh, Mrs. Astor who would plan parties and, and tell the you know, new rich and the new Americans who really, you know, America was a new country, it still is a new country compared to Europe, uh, how to behave and the etiquette of the time and how they did that in Europe and you know, how to you know, properly serve champagne, all that. So he had mastered in that. And so he kind of set the rules that we had to follow. And, uh, and he kind of came up with a list of 400 people who would be proper in one room. I don't know if they ever got 400 people into this, but there is a list that he made up of 400 people, you know, husbands, wives, families. And uh, it was always his claim that people who could all be comfortable in one space without making others uncomfortable. So it was very, very, um, you know, small world. If you read uh, Edith Wharton, which is wonderful, House of Mirth, Age of Innocence, it, it dwells into that. Of course, the movies, I recommend The Age of Innocence, House of Mirth. But Mrs. Astor um, used to, would be asked by friends sometimes that why she did not um, invite Mr. Stewart, who had the magnificent mansion across the street, uh, to any of her parties. And she said, just because I buy my carpets from Mr. Stewart's store doesn't mean he should expect to walk on them. And that was the, the sort of, you know, feeling about those who were in trade. Sometimes you see that a little bit in Downton Abbey where, you know, there were those who were landed gentry and worked in their estates and the Esters worked in real estate, didn't really work and they owned half of New York almost. So they just, you know, made their fortune by buying more land and the rents and so on. 
and those who actually went to an office every day. And uh, like Mr. Stewart was a shopkeeper, of course, on a grand scale. So we move on to, um, and just as to leave, I don't like to get into what happened to these houses early on, but the side of Mrs. Astor's house eventually became, and her nephew's house on 33rd Street, 34th Street and Fifth Avenue became the Waldorf Astoria, the first one, which was torn down in the 1920s. And now of course, it's the site of the Empire State Building. So it uh, changed quite a bit. Moving on to the um, A.T. Stewart house, like I said, he was a very wealthy, um, you know, department store king, and he built this sort of um, elaborate Second French Empire house. Very, um, and you see in the other sides of the pictures, it's surrounded by brownstone. A lot of New York was constructed in brownstone in the early years, and it was cheap and easy to carve. And um, so Edith, uh, Edith Warden had once said that brownstone was the ugliest color type of stone ever created, and that New York was drab. It was just a, a brown you know, world because of all the drab brownstone. So of course, when people wanted to make an impression, they went to limestone and marble and white dazzling palaces. So Mr. Stewart's house was one of the first that broke the brownstone mold. And of course, you know, the idea is when you have a great deal of money, you want to feel that, that you have culture. So you went to Europe and you would pretty much shop to your drop. You'd have art dealers selling you things when they knew a wealthy American millionaire was coming. And oftentimes a lot of the things that they bought were fakes that were later discovered to be fakes. But, um, but you had always had a statuary hall. And it's funny how the Victorians in, you know, of this period um, very, you know, as far as being dressed personally, were very you know, heavily clad where no hardly any skin was ever shown at all, but their houses were lined with many, you know, Greek and Roman sculptures and, and paintings of, of nudes. So it's kind of like ironic, but, um, but that was what they, they did. So this is an earlier Gilded Age interior. As you can see, it's, it's too bad that there are not colored pictures of that. Some, there are some hand colored pictures of other houses, but uh, it does show the exuberance of the interiors of this early period. Uh, Herder Brothers had done a lot of interiors and, um, and I could say it's just the details. If one goes to Lockwood Matthews Mansion in Connecticut, New York, Connecticut, you can get a sense of the, the detail in that house is the same period. And uh, it's not exactly furnished with the original furniture, but it does have um, the feel for it. But looking at these houses, I just say, and as we go through this lecture, we're going to see a great change because, you know, changes from the, this house was about 1870s. And as we end with the houses from the 1910s, um, you know, that's 40 years and 40 years of fashion and change. And as we all know, things change a lot in 40 years. But in these earlier Gilded Age houses, they're heavily draped, tasseled, fringed. There's not a surface to put anything on. And this was Mr. Stewart's art gallery. The painting at the rear is called The Horse Fair after Mrs. Stewart died. It was bought by Cornelius Vanderbilt and now it is in the Metropolitan. So if you go there, you will probably find that painting. One wonders where all these paintings are, but um, they have, you know, gone. The Stewart house was torn down in the, um, about the uh, 1890s because it eventually became a club. So here we have people walking up Fifth Avenue because Fifth Avenue is always about moving uptown. Um, most people wouldn't recognize where this is at, but this is the 42nd Street Library site. This is the Croton Reservoir, which was where water came from upstate, and that's where New York City got its water for that part of town. And this is probably seen from Easter Sunday or a Sunday where everybody was dressed and all the millionaires had houses on Fifth Avenue, and they all went out parading, and, and lots of people who, who weren't millionaires would dress up in their best and like to mingle with them to see if they could see a famous millionaire. And, and um, it was a place of blending and hoping that someday that, that those who weren't millionaires or very rich could uh, through some form of invention or whatever, uh, one day have a house on Fifth Avenue, which was the, which was the, was the, uh, the goal for most of that. This is always an interesting view because as we hardly realize now, Fifth Fifth Avenue and all of Upper Manhattan, uh, when it became a grid, they just paved over, made a grid, which makes getting around New York City actually kind of interesting, but uh, simple actually compared to Paris or London, which is, you know, but much more interesting, beautiful to go through. But here we have uh, Madison Avenue at 56 and 57th Street on the left side. 
So when the grid was built, it just plowed through whatever was in its way. You had shanties, you had farms, you had cows, you had uh, you know, just farmers that were living there. But little by little, the mansions moved up Fifth Avenue. And the house we see here, the White House with the mansard roof was the home of Mary Mason Jones. Um, in the book, um, The Age of Innocence, there is a scene where um, Edith Wharton writes about one of the um, characters as being a large woman who builds a house on Upper Fifth Avenue in the middle of nowhere. And she has said that, um, that basically she expects other great families to build better and bigger mansions around her in the future. And at one time she would not be in the middle of nowhere, but would be in the center of everything. And shortly she was. Um, a lot of the houses in New York City were modeled after French houses. And, you know, as an architect, it, you know, they, they went over to Europe and took sort pieces of the chateaus and French architecture and blended it all together. Most of the time, pretty good, but, you know, there are some bad examples. But, uh, but this house actually on the corner is the home of Mary Mason Jones. And, um, and the rest of it was uh, sort of townhouses that she rented out to um, people, you know, in the 400 or people that she knew. But in time, like she said, she would be um, moving, have, expecting to have other fine families and other great mansions would be built around her. So before that time, you have the Vanderbilt family, which, uh, which we're not gonna get into tonight because it's just too much on that. But this is sort of the beginning of the Vanderbilt's rise of Fifth Avenue. So William Henry Vanderbilt, he builds this house. Uh, it's actually three houses. The main house on the left is for himself. And then he had a, uh, a similar shaped house which had was two houses for his two daughters and this was on 51st street but this was brownstone but it's heavily ornate and the interiors are really were amazing I, I wish i can't possibly get into all these houses tonight but i do do all the talks that go into more fifth avenue houses and wouldn't it be nice if fifth avenue did look like that today it looks so serene and quiet and imagine the clippy cloppy of the horses maybe maybe at five o'clock in the morning it it still sounds like that a little bit but we all know it's very different today but of course this is a, a long time ago compared to today but here we on the left we have the um william henry vanderbilt houses and we're going to look at the house that's up there um which is the french chateau of william k vanderbilt And we're just gonna briefly look at this one here, but this was sort of like a, while the Stewart house was, you know, white stone um, and it was pretty well done. This house was created by Richard Morris Hunt and was considered to be the best example of a French chateau at that time. And as you see, it just takes the corner, knocks down all the drab brownstone houses that were there and rises where everybody, you know, I'd like to imagine these as when, which I wasn't there either, but when New York City was masonry and the glass building started to rise on Park Avenue and uh, how that was changing Park Avenue. And now of course you can't notice one glass building from another on Park Avenue. Or let's say you take the Guggenheim Museum, which still today does sort of make an impression different from the, the neighboring uh, buildings. So at this time, the, the William K. Vanderbilt House would have been as striking as any of those. Richard Morris Hunt in 1882. Many of these houses, one of the things are dark inside. They actually weren't that dark. I mean, they all had usually great staircases that were lit by um, skylights. And this is a marble staircase. It went up for three stories and, um, and the halls were decorated. And so it really must have been dazzling. As you said, some of the townhouses that we still go into today, which are smaller, you go in most of the staircases are lit by skylights. They had an elaborately carved uh, living room And one of the French first French period um, paneled um, uh, music rooms here, salons, which actually had paneling from a, uh, a French house, is one of the first good examples they claim. And a dining hall with musicians' gallery, because in those days you wanted your orchestra, but you wanted it to be hidden and out of the way. So we get back into the um, the evolution, which actually does. Um, we get into the Senator Clark House later on. Um, Charles Dana Gibson was a wonderful artist and he did all these illustrations of the, um, the very rich at the time, mostly parodies. 
he uh, you know loved making you know sort of comedy pieces about the the foibles of the very rich in the Gilded Age. So here you have an example. It says Mrs. Steele Pool's housewarming, and a lot of the um, you know wealthy people from the Midwest and California, where they made a great fortune, they all want to come to New York and and set their mark there because there's the old saying: if you make it in New York, you've made it everywhere. So everybody strove to have a house on Fifth Avenue and be accepted in New York society. You could be a king or queen of San Francisco society or other societies, but New York was still the star. And so people really, really you know, strove to be accepted in New York society. So what do they do? They either buy or build a great mansion. They have the best interior designers. They have all the artwork. They get their women get their dresses made at worth. They have jewels. They have staff. They have you know they just have everything to impress, and then they send out invitations to you know the A list, but most of the A list doesn't show up because they don't know who Mrs. Steelpool is. I mean she's a it's a fictitious name, but it's just funny. So she has a housewarming party, and obviously no one shows up. Same thing here, it's called the troubles of the rich. At the last moment, some send their regrets. So here you have this large Gilded Age dining table with silver and footmen and all that. And, and only, you know, a few guests show up who probably didn't have any place else to go to. And they weren't Mrs. Astor's set. And, you know, and it's uh, disappointing. There's many movies actually that have been made about, actually there's a, <laughs> It's not very accurate, but there's a movie um, with Debbie Reynolds called The Unsinkable Molly Brown. And that's always fun to see. It's almost the same story where they wanted to break into Denver society and they give a kind of rather gaudy uh, party. And, and anyhow, I recommend watching that sort of a, an idea for this. And then of course you have the um, another scene where you have those who are not in New York society who want to be in New York society. The goal was that, you know, usually the, the wives wanted their children to to mix with the you know the upper crust if you want to call it and so they would do anything to get into society to mingle so that their children mostly daughters would marry other you know wealthy people and, and eventually move up which often was the case so here you have a thing called the social push almost and you have the <laughs> the little old millionaire on the side there the man who made the fortune and his wife who was not going to be uh <laughs> shut out of, of society. So it's, you know, you should look up online. There's so many Charles Dinner Gibson drawings. He did the Gibson Girl and a wonderful illustrator, a parody of showing the, um, like I said, the troubles of the rich. So getting back to the Alva Vanderbilt house. Uh, so Alva Vanderbilt, of course, was not in a New York society. We'll be very brief with this. And she wanted to be in New York society, but Mrs. Astor didn't recognize her. So she gives a housewarming party and somehow word is out that Mrs. Astor's um, daughter was not invited and Mrs. Astor wasn't invited because um, Mrs. Astor had never sort of paid a visit or acknowledged um, Alva Vanderbilt, who is Mrs. William K. Vanderbilt. And so um, Alva Vanderbilt sort of schemes to have a, the most fabulous house and have the biggest party. And it's talked about in all the media of the time and the costumes and everybody's chattering about the Vanderbilt ball. But for some reason, the Astors didn't get an invitation. So, so to make a very long story short, is eventually um, Mrs. Astor has to come and you know bring her card to the door and her card is received by Alva. And then she is sent an invitation and Mrs. Astor and Alva, you know, are together and supposedly that lets the Vanderbilts are now in New York society. So um, so that's in a nutshell. So there are no photographs of the party because the photography at the time uh, wasn't good for movement. There's actually a series of, of pictures of um, the party guests, but this does show you it was the numbers are phenomenal, supposedly $400,000 in champagne. I can't imagine that really, but the newspapers went crazy. And a lot of this stuff is just re reading historical articles, supposedly you know, $100,000 in roses. I mean, but whatever they had, they certainly had the most of everything. So and now as we move up again up Fifth Avenue, uh, William K. Vanderbilt, who was the um, he, he was the son of uh, you know William Henry Vanderbilt, who we just looked at, he had an elder brother Cornelius Vanderbilt, and he was the eldest, uh, said the eldest brother, so he felt he was the head of the family. Well, well, William K. and Alva were really shaking things up with their glamorous house and the parties. He kind of felt, well, he needed a uh, 
substantial house too. And the uh, Cornelius Vandals were a little more on the retiring side, but anyhow, they decided that they had to have a house on 57th Street and Fifth Avenue. And here you might recognize the corner. It's actually where Bergdorf is today, giving something away. He eventually had a smaller house, which was just a portion of the corner, but he, uh, it's in the French style, and he really wanted to have a, um, the, whole, the whole block. So little by little, he was able to buy all the adjoining sort of brownstones and um, build a much bigger house. So for those obviously familiar with New York is um, for those who know the Grand Army Plaza, the Plaza Hotel in this picture is the first Plaza Hotel, which I'm going to show in a second. And getting back to the Vanderbilt House, you see the little, not the church spires, but the little peak roof. That's the, the original smaller house that's overlooking um, the unpaved and not the Grand Army Plaza that we know of today, but those other sort of brownstones. And there's another sort of um, French style mansion on the right behind the trees. This is about 1890s. And I, I just love this scene. You see the Mary Mason Jones on the left uh, with you know, the French mansard roof there. It just seems it's, it's sort of busy New York, but it's hard to imagine it's sort of like on paved roads and you know, nannies and carriages. And, and to the left is, is the Apple store, which we all know so well today. So moving ahead, you know, a hundred years and more. So eventually he does turn the corner and he builds the, the very large house, which is now it's about 130 rooms. And then the house you saw behind the trees is to the right. It is not all one house, but it does seem to be like that. Some more views of the plaza here. As you said, the Apple store would be that tall building on the left there. And um, Birdross is where the Vanderbilt Mansion there is there and Plaza Hotel is you know, in the background. And we're just zooming through this right now. But here we have the original Plaza Hotel, which was built by the 1890s. At the time it was built, it was considered very luxurious and you know, the top and overlooked Central Park, but it shortly became outdated and wasn't luxurious enough. So it only lasted about maybe 15 years and then was torn down for today's Plaza Hotel, which here looks like a skyscraper. And as we all know, in New York today, it looks like a little teeny tiny <laughs> castle compared to the super 100 story towers that are all around it on 57th Street. And to the left of this picture, you have the um, what's called the Alexander House, which is the other wing, not a wing, but part of that sort of Cornelius Vanderbilt sort of scene. Um, but I just love these pictures of this and it just shows a skyscraper effect and yet they still try to be like a chateau with a chateau roof. Like I said, this is about 1907. And now we're moving up to Fifth Avenue and getting to um, our, our three main matches of discussion. But I just love these scenes. The, the uh, Sherman statue is still there. I don't think they ever moved that. They regilded it and I think it's time for another one. And we had the Mary Mason Jones house. And then we see in the background, the St. Regis Hotel. So that's the whole point of Fifth Avenue always changing is that little by little, the houses were on lower Fifth Avenue, little by little, the merchants, you know, the jewelers, the clothing, you know, uh, florists all wanted to be on Fifth Avenue because it was so fashionable. And they would um, rent um, the older mansions, bringing commercial and trade to Fifth Avenue. And then everybody else next generation would move further uptown on Fifth Avenue. So right now we're at the, Plaza, and this is pretty much the hub of it at that time. Mrs. Astor eventually, when she tears down her um, her her brown drab boxy mansion, certainly wants to keep up with everybody and builds a sort of very large French mansion. It's actually a a double mansion, and it's for um, her son John Jacob Astor and his wife and children, and for herself. Richard Morris Hunt designed it, obviously French chateau design has one of the most glamorous staircases. I really wish this staircase still existed. Supposedly Mrs. Astor, like I said, was very active. She gave all these parties. She wore um, Worth gowns with, with very fashionable, you know, fashion designer for those who don't know about Worth in Paris. Like I said, mostly the things that everybody um, clamored to have with French fashions, French food, French champagne, you know, everything French was, was what one wanted to have. And, uh, and here we see that chandelier from her ballroom reused as the chandelier in her staircase. And supposedly people say in the stories that she would walk down the staircase wearing lots and lots of diamonds, supposedly from the royal courts that were being sold off in the 1860s uh, that were from, you know, obviously Marie Antoinette and the whole period there. And they sometimes claim that she dazzled brighter than the chandelier because she wore so many diamonds. 
And so she would come down and receive her, her 400 here. So I found this plan. It's funny, you would think there's lots of plans of these houses. There are, but actually some houses never seem to have found a floor plan. Well, it was designed by Richard Morris Hunt who designed Biltmore House, the Breakers in Newport and Marble House, very, you know, very famous architect. The floor plans, and even Washington where uh, his collection is, um, never saw a floor plan. So one day at Googling, whatever, this is like 10 years ago, typed in the Astor Mansion on Fifth Avenue. And, and all of a sudden I see these and I think like, well, what is that? That's so odd. And, um, and what it was, it was actually in a plumbing catalog. I mean, you never know what you find in these little other obscure electrical plumbing suppliers, you know, catalogs, and they had all four plans of this house. And so you see, it's truly a double house. You came into the left and you entered either to the left uh, door, which was Mrs. Astor's wing, or to the right, which was her son's wing. Similar rooms. And um, like I, I do get into more details though, but um, you see one of her salons where she supposedly would stand in front of her portrait, receiving guests and chit-chatting and so on and whatever. And then she would also receive in her ballroom. There are very few photographs of Mrs. Astor. She also didn't like being photographed, but there are some illustrations. Supposedly they say the uh, illustrations are rather flattering that she was not as tall and regal as, as she looks in some of these, but um, and this is the new famous ballroom, which was probably the one that was most you know, talked about. And some even claim it could have fit 1200. I think you know, that's pretty hard to fit. It's a big room, but I don't know. But anyhow, the show is the painting is still in the same style, all stepped upon each other. A great a fireplace, it was uh, lit by a skylight. And on the left there under the big painting is a sort of a sofa, which was Mrs. Astor's throne where she would sit and, uh, and like I said, there's more to tell about that, but this is the scene of Mrs. Astor. So now we get to um, the first of our houses here. And this is the house of George Gould, which is on Fifth Avenue and 67th Street. And um, here we'll see, this is the later house, but George J. Gould, who, you know, from 1864 to 1923 was the son of the notorious Wall Street robber Baron Jay Gould, who also has his own home, which is Lyndhurst on the Hudson in Tarrytown, which is open to the public. I think the grounds are now, I don't know the interiors yet with the, with the COVID still on, but, um, but you can visit that house, it has a wonderful website too. But anyhow, he, and his father when he died in 1892, left about $90 million, which would be um, billions today. So he basically took over the family business. He had a lot of brothers and sisters. I actually also do a talk just on the Gould Mansions and uh, they actually had a wonderful time spending their father's money. So uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Gould, George Gould married Edith Kingdom. Now at the time, and also the house in the background we see in the corner was 47th Street and Fifth Avenue was the uh, Jay Gould's family home. And he raised his children as sort of you know, another sort of proud but drab sort of somewhat French brownstone house. And then he um, also bought the house behind where we see a little bit brighter for his son, George Gould, when he marries Edith Kingdom. Now Edith Kingdom was very beautiful, but unfortunately, or according unfortunately for his mother, she was an actress and, and, and men from wealthy, you know, you know, let's say, you know, well brought up families did not marry actresses in, the, in that time. And it was like kind of like, you know, socially a ruin, even though the Goulds really weren't in society. But Mrs. Helen Gould, his mother, supposedly, you know, took to her bed and never recovered from the marriage and was so appalled. And even, even though Edith was charming and tried to make, you know, peace with her mother-in-law, her mother-in-law really didn't want anything to do with her because she was a, an actress of all horrible things, you know, and just like in those days, that's, that's what it was thought of. And um, so, but she gave uh, Mr. Um, George Gould a large family and uh, eventually they decided to move to a, a new house up on Upper Fifth Avenue. Now, Edith Gould, um, when Mr. Wolf Colin George met Edith Gould, he was um, 
uh, he certainly loved a, uh, you know, a, a beautiful woman. In those days, the so-called hourglass figure was something very admirable. You know, this, uh, we get into so many talks on the Gilded Age Society on Facebook about how people, women, obtain these uh, corseted sort of hourglass figures. And sometimes they say they were accentuated and some of the old photos are photoshopped in their day. And, but anyhow, um, you know, that's a whole nother topic for a fashion person, but she had a very a famous hourglass figure. And then when she um, married George Gould, he gave her a $500,000 pearl necklace, which um, pearls in those days were considered, you know, much more valuable than diamonds because they were real pearls, not cultured pearls. And pearls came from, you know, an oyster that occurred naturally. And so to find matching strands and so on, it was very, very difficult, and very expensive. And imagine $500,000 in you know, the 1890s. So uh, it must be, you know, way up there in the millions or whatever. But anyhow, and so this, so he was very, you know, he, he knew what he liked. He, he liked a, a beautiful woman and, and that's what she was. And she was very proud of her jewels and her figure. So the first house they have is that they move up to their own home away from Jay Gould's. And uh, also his father did pass in 1892. So this is their house at Fifth Avenue and 67th Street. Now, the funny thing that we would look at some of these wonderful mansions that were on Fifth Avenue, so many of these mansions that we remember or see, or even like with the Frick uh, Mansion, thank God it's still there today, um, that actually replaced a, a library, a Richard Morris Hunt Library. So a lot of these really mansions that we see in later pictures mostly replace other drab brownstones. So this house here, as you can see, is a sort of a French style, Gothic, you know, Victorian, you know, at the time would be very impressive, but little by little, it grows out of fashion. You have um, a Stern house, I think it's a Louis Stern, builds a sort of a classical house next door, probably out of white marble. So it makes the Gould house look kind of a little, little old fashioned. So they hire Horace Trumbauer in 1906, as obviously their family grows. They had, I think, six children. And, um, and it's obviously, it fits right in with the house next door. Looks very grand and formal, and, and that's really what they wanted. And it's it really, I have to say, I sometimes do in my Facebook groups, just like, which house do you like better? Some people like the so-called Victorian house better, and some people say this is too cold. And uh, it's always an interesting choice. Unfortunately, there's not too many pictures of the old house inside, but there are quite a few of the interiors of the, um, the new house, which I'm gonna show you now. So some of the houses that still exist in New York in this style, uh, one can get the feeling of what it must have been like. This is the entrance hall. Most of these great houses entered on the first floor, which is really not in a sense your first floor. It was sort of like the reception floor where you came in, took off your coats, if you gave parties, you know, other rooms, offices would lead to obviously the servant's wing. But then you climb to a second floor, which would be really the formal first floor. And like I just said, they, um, they collected, as you see, it's just as overstuffed as the Stewart house, which we saw before, but maybe better antiques and uh, a lot of um, shopping in France and bringing over pieces. Sometimes people would have a piece from Versailles or a famous chateau, but obviously maybe they only had one chair. So a lot of American furniture was actually um, reproductions or created to match an antique. And they had workers, of course, all the time creating furniture in the style of the originals. Because even then, furniture from Versailles would still be phenomenally expensive, and everybody was very proud to have a piece from Versailles. Fortunately, over the years, a lot of it's been returned to Versailles. This was the dining room. This is probably during the house when it's about to be taken down. I always love this entrance hall. I think it's really beautiful. It's very cool. And, you know, I said a wonderful example we have is, is the Frick collection to get a sense of that very cool elegance, which uh, Thank goodness that's still there. And, and even when the Frick house was built, it was about half the size because when he died, it eventually became a museum and they added on another wing to it. But this gives a flavor that sort of 18th century French design and with the porcelains and the statuary, very different than we saw in the, the Stewart house. Uh, one could talk about these pictures forever about every little antique and detail and, um, you know, each house alone could be a, a talk on itself. This was the music room. And while like I said, well, the, um, 
the Goulds uh, eventually became, as Mrs. Astor would pass in about 1907, uh, would become pretty much in, I don't even know whether there was an A-list society anymore after Mrs. Astor. They all merged and they all became one big sort of society of millionaires. And, um, and so they entertained a lot. And of course, they could be very happy entertaining with um, other, other, those, other wealthy millionaires who were not in Mrs. Astor's world. So it took a while for the ghouls to be accepted. And um, this is the library. A lot of animal skins in all these houses. It was the fashion of the time, plus all these palm trees that they had. What's so nice about seeing these pictures and so few houses, museum houses today, really show houses that are, feel like they're homes because it's all the little details of the picture frames and little jars and, and every little you know piece that that's what makes it feel like a home. I and mean, we'd love seeing these museum houses, but you know they're either covered with plexiglass, which is understandable, but it's these little details that really make them feel like you know homes. This was Mr. Gould's uh, bedroom, usually men's rooms are very masculine, dark and English. And another uh, poor line there on the left. And the ladies rooms, Mrs. Gould's bedroom was um, obviously French. Most of the women of the house had French style bedrooms. She has her bed on a platform, sort of <laughs> somewhat queen-like and uh, her maids would come. I have to say, I have never seen any other views of this room, but it's, um, you know, it, it's furniture in front of all the doors. So it's just like, uh, you yeah. know. And one thing about these houses, what people say sometimes the um, main rooms seem kind of cold and too big and you couldn't be comfortable there. Most people who lived in these homes really lived on the second floor and in sort of master and bedroom suites, which would be much more comfortable and, and where they could be more relaxed. Leaving the uh, New York townhouse, the Goulds also had a uh, country estate in um, Lakewood, New Jersey. It's actually Georgian Court College today. That gives you an idea of, of the wealth of the family. I'll just go through these quickly. The house does exist pretty much intact. The furniture, of course, is not there, but it is um, nice to know it's there. Most of these houses, country houses, and even city houses had conservatories. And I said the Goulds just had so much money that you know their children all had their little individual, you know, motor cars and a chauffeur to watch over them. And the idea of entertaining in the Gilded Age was every party had to be a little different so that everybody in society could talk about, oh, the Goulds gave this party on Saturday night. It, it had this, it had that. And, and you know, I, I go into other talks sometimes, my Newport talks about all the uh, you know, party favorites, which are diamonds and emeralds and all sorts of fa fascinating things just to make everybody excited. But anyhow, when the Goulds you know, wanted to have a chess party, they hired, obviously, you know, real people to play the chess pieces. I don't know how they actually um, got them to uh, say, you know, did they have a megaphone? Say, you move here night, whatever this, <laughs> I don't know what happened when a piece had to be removed or they had to run across the board. So, but anyhow, this was a really quite a um, written up um, event and all the media and the newspapers just loved, um, you know, talking about it and writing up the ghouls and the chess pieces. And so it was the more over the top you could get, that's what they were looking for almost in a sense, uh, Unlike Mrs. Astor, who didn't really like publicity, most of the other village millions loved publicity, even though it didn't always do them so, so good, as we'll see in a second. The, um, this is the family, George Gould and Edith and their children. And here we have Edith Gould and George, a little older. Like I said, Mrs. Gould was um, very proud of her hourglass figure. She's, and as one knows, as one gets older, it's always hard to keep your figure from the 20s, men and women. And um, so she did exercises and did all sorts of things. And, uh, but she tended to like champagne and she liked chocolates. And there's a, one story, one of the Gould histories about how she would um, go shopping for chocolates for, for her guests at her party, of course. and. Um, but somehow either hide them in like urns or drawers and they'd always be, and she would insist that her maids and her secretary hide all the chocolates from her or she had to beg for them, but she never seemed to have, from according from the biography, a, a shortage of chocolates on hand. So she, unfortunately, she did um, struggle to maintain her figure. So and here she is in a much younger picture. 
But Mr. Gould, unfortunately, um, still liked a an younger hourglass figure, not so much hourglass later on. And he sort of goes back to Broadway while Edith is in New Jersey and sees some plays and, um, and meets another young actress, Genevieve um, Jean Sinclair. And he has a, um, a relationship with her. She gives him two children out of marriage. And of course, Edith knows that, but she sort of like, you know, they accepted it and whatever. And, um, and then unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Gould dies on the um, golf course at Georgian Court. They actually said she was heavily wrapped up in a rubber corset and to maintain her figure the best she could. And then she kind of had problems with breathing and that may have contributed to her heart attack. She actually died in her fifties. So Mr. Gould then was free to, uh, to marry Genevieve and, um, and he had another child with her. And that was about 1923, 22 when Mrs. Edith Gould died. And then he immediately married her about six months later. But then I guess sadly, uh, a year later, he catches pneumonia and then he dies. So, and then um, there's a big, big, big fight over the estate because she, um, Genevieve, who's second wife now, wants to live in the, the Gould Mansion, which, um, but you know, the money is broken up amongst his original children, the fortune's divided, there was some, um, there was a proper estate planning. So a lot of the money went to taxes. And of course, so many lawyers were fighting over it for everybody's side. So the end, in the end, very, not most of, most of the people in the uh, family didn't receive a very large cut of what they should have had. And uh, so that the house is uh, put up for sale, emptied, auctioned off the contents. About the same time in about 1925, Alice Vanderbilt, who also, if you know Newport, has the breakers in Newport, that's the summer house, this is the winter house. Uh, it's beginning much, we'll see in a second some scenes of it later on in the 1920s, um, decides to have enough of it. While she's still the widow of Cornelius Venable, who was very, very rich, uh, I guess money was becoming a little harder. The taxes on these uh, property, they said, I think this was about $130,000 a year in, in the 1920s. And uh, it was getting to be too much. Actually, all her children had grown up, of course. So you have a really just one woman living in a very large house with a very large shed. So she decides to um, to sell it. We all think it's heartbreaking how they could possibly tear this down. And she sells it to a um, builders and developers. And um, so then she moves to the Gould Mansion. I think this was here, yes. So, and unfortunately, um, it's odd that she moved there because she never let the Goulds in her home, but uh, she ends up living in the Gould Mansion. And then she lives there to about the 1930s. And then when she passes, it becomes a school. And then unfortunately in 1963, the Gould Mansion is demolished and it's replaced by the apartment building at 857 Fifth Avenue, which is kind of a 60s building. And it's, you know, it's, it's a building of that era, let's just leave it at that. Okay. So the, um, now we have the William Collins Whitney Mansion, and we're just gonna briefly talk about this for the society. It is also, we're gonna to touch upon the Solomon House, and this gives you an idea. This house was an older house on the outside. Stanford Y did a complete interior redecoration of the house. And while the outside looks rather drab, it was amazing on the inside. And I'm certainly gonna show you a few shots. They had wonderful staircases as they kept sweeping up with, with old tapestries. And probably one of the most glamorous uh, ballrooms in New York at the time. And uh, supposedly Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney um, lived in this house after um, her husband bought it from his father's estate. And those who, um, Gloria Vanderbilt was, you know, little Gloria at the time, a very famous custody case in the 1930s. And her aunt got custody of little Gloria. And supposedly some books, uh, while well, Gertrude had, um, children of her own. Little Glory, when she was living here at this house, they said that the ballroom was used for roller skating. Well, it was a nice place to roller skate. So um, sadly, the house was um, also taken down in the, in the 1940s. But I had this wonderful monograph of the, um, the auction. It's a long story, this house, but um, the house had a wonderful auction catalog, but the auction was never held because um, Mr. 
you know, Harry Whitney bought it from his father's estate. Someone else had bought it after his father died, but only had it for about a year, then they died. So he pretty much bought the house intact. And they had a beautiful monograph printed for the auction catalog and uh, the auction never took place. But I, I have fortunately have a copy of it and it has so many rooms and illustrations and it's, but this was the ceiling of, of the ballroom we just saw. Mr. Whitney gave a housewarming party. If you notice in the picture, there seems to be a man who, uh, you know, dressed as a jockey on a horse. Well, of course, he's standing with sort of a horse skirt around him. Mr. Whitney was very big in um, the equestrian world. The Edson Martin Bradley Ball was another very level. As you see, everything was kind of, you know, French and royal courts. And um, so that was a ball that was held and it was sensationalized. And Mrs. Uh, Martin felt that she was helping out conditions during a bad economy because she was hiring the caterers and the costume makers and everybody working. And, but of course the press really, you know, killed it off and the, the Bradley Martins had to move to inland for a few years because um, there was even some claim where the city of New York was gonna raise the taxes on their townhouse because they said, oh, they're so rich, we can raise the taxes. It doesn't sound like that could happen. But anyhow, the, the Martins did eventually uh, leave for inland and stayed there for many years because the, the ball got such bad press of uh, being so ostentatious at a time when, when people were you know, suffering. Now we get to the Senator William Clark House, Andrews Clark House, and a house that was heavily criticized when it was built because it's probably built a little late, uh, but if it had been built during the 1890s and by a Vanderbilt, it probably would be considered the most incredible house in New York. It still is the most incredible house in New York, sadly it, it is gone. But those, um, you know, want to know who Mr. Clark was, it was William S. Clark, 18, 39 to 1925. He was a Montana mining titan and often called the Copper King. So he was phenomenally rich. He was served as a senator from Montana. And he was the father of Huguette Clark, whose life was portrayed in the best selling book, Empty Mansions, which uh, many people have read that. I certainly recommend reading that at the actually the end of the show. I do have a link to books I recommend on my website garylawrence.com slash books. You, you'll find it at the end of the show in the credits there. So. But as I said, the, um, the press of the day hated this house. It was too showy, too ostentatious, too over the top. It was just really, Miss, Mr. Clark couldn't do anything right, according to the media. And so, um, so someone wrote a little poem. Actually, it's even longer than what I have here, but the poem went, Senator Coppa of Donapaw Ditch, you know, they're making fun of his, you know, his, uh, you know, mining background, you know, and made a clean billion in mining in Sitch, hiked for New York where his money he blew, building a palace on Fifth Avenue. How says the Senator, can I look proudest? Build me a house that howls the loudest. None of your, your slab-sided plain mausoleums give, give me the treasures of art and museums. Build it new fangled, scalloped and angled, fine like a wedding cake garnished with pills. Gents, do your duty, tread out your beauty. Give me my money's worth, I'll pay the bills. Pillows ionic, ease Babylonic, doors cut in scallops resembling a shell. Roof was Egyptian, gables condition. Whole grand effect when completed was hell. And this was written um, in a poem in a newspaper by Wallace Irving in 1912. And obviously that wasn't Mr. Clark saying that, it was sort of his parody of it. And there's actually another part that goes on to say, 48 architects came to consult and all when done was a splendid result or something. So it actually goes on longer and longer. It was really quite a poem and he really, really trashed the house, but it's, um, and yeah, it, it's really kind of, let's say ornate, uh, but it must have had a huge tower. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know if they were, building codes in those days about what you get away with, but obviously, uh, you know, um, he did whatever he wanted to. This is a staircase. Uh, this is seen kind of when it's um, at the end. It only lasted about 23 years, the house. You know, it's the uh, floor plan is amazing. And like I said, I don't know how many floors, it must have had eight floors. If you go into the other floors, the basements and so on. 
but Mr. Clark did sort of wanted to leave it as a museum, but um, there was no endowment, and that's another long story. <laughs> you have to read the book for that. Um, but the um, but as you can see, it's an incredible maze of a house, and it's really I'm sure everybody would love to visit this house today. It existed plus filled with art, which we're going to see in another second here. Reception room. This was the famous gold salon. And this was taken from a, a French house. And of course, sometimes when they would take pieces from these uh, French originals or European originals, they sometimes had to add panels and reconfigure the pieces. This room when the house was taken down was, um, uh, was put in the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, DC. Actually, the Corcoran Gallery was built by uh, Mr. Clark's estate to um, house this room. And it's still there today, even though I think the Corcoran Gallery is now a school and some of the art went other places. But this room does still exist, and you can see um, how glittery and gold it was. Sort of not exactly like the gold room in Marble House, but it's a beautiful, you know, look at any room in Versailles, and it would be amazing. So, dining room. It's interesting to see these rooms sometimes without the furniture. And galleries of porcelains and tapestries and rugs. More art, imagine going shopping. He seems to have some space on the top. He didn't finish. <laughs> and then by 1920s, he had died and um, his family didn't really want it. I think there was actually, he had another family from a first marriage who also wanted part of the money. I'm not exactly sure. There's various stories that whether it was meant to be left as a museum, he did want to give treasures to the Metropolitan, but they didn't want it without enough money. And, um, and the land was so incredibly valuable that, um, you know, the developers were just offering huge sums for these, these mansion sites in those days. And, and Mrs. Uh, Clark, his second wife and daughter, he had two daughters, didn't want to live in this house. Actually, his other daughter had died prior to that. But so you had Huguette Clark. So they moved to a, a Fifth Avenue building and still live in great luxury, but they didn't want anything to do with this house. So like I said, in about 23 years, its uh, pieces were removed. There was some interest in trying to sell off the marble staircase we first saw, but in the end it was just trashed and, and thrown in the, uh, in the dumps and the, sometimes the river and sometimes swamps. And uh, so all these houses, most of the core of stonework was really destroyed. So like I said, it was demolished in 1927 and replaced by the apartment building at 965th Avenue, which is a beautiful building today. And so um, it's hard to choose, but that, um, but it is, there was nothing like the center of Clark House. Fortunately, we have one block and we're almost getting to the end. That still exists. This is the Duke House at 78th Street, which is a New York University building now. And we have the French Consul, the French Embassy here, which was a, um, a Whitney house and next to it is the Cook Mansion, which was recently sold, still as a private residence. And then we have the Isaac Fletcher House, the Ukrainian Institute of America, which also is uh, still there today. So that if you want to get a glimpse of the Gilded Age and actually this whole side street of 79th Street is uh, very much still filled with houses. You can get an idea of what it must have been like. Getting to what we spoke about in the beginning, the Brokaw House. Um, after Penn Station was torn down in the early 1960s, people were becoming aware that they were losing a lot of uh, New York great architecture and treasures. And there was a big protest. There's lots of newspaper clippings and pictures online about people fighting to keep this. Actually, the broker houses were about maybe, I think there were almost four houses because he built the first one, then he built two for his sons, and then he, I think, had a daughter. And so the whole block there, the corner, was. Um, all one mansion and, and actually was eventually um, sold to an institute. But then uh, by the 1960s, um, they left and they did everything to try to preserve this. And, but unfortunately over one weekend, uh, the builder came in and um, you know did enough damage to the building to scrap it so that they wanted to go to court to try to save it. But so much damage had been done by the time Monday morning came along there it was no point anymore. I mean, they didn't take the whole thing down, but enough damage has been done, which is often the case. And so sadly, this building was lost and maybe it serves that it made greater awareness to try to keep what we have. It's a very big battle, but, um, and um, as just, and now it's been replaced by a 1960s apartment building, which I had to say is, is, is nothing in comparison to, to what was lost. 
Now we get on to our last house, the William Solomon house. When people ask me, do I have a favorite? Well, you wouldn't think that this might be it, um, but it's um, another house that was from an earlier era, which got a great renovation on the inside. This is William J. Solomon, 1852 to 1919. He was a banker at Spire and Company. It was a very big Gilbert Age banking company. Then he founded the banking firm of William Solomon and Company. And he was also the board chairman of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. So a very wealthy man. So he buys this house, which I said was older and it got remodeled about 1902. I also have a wonderful monograph in this house, this house. A lot of these houses had privately printed monographs. They were very limited editions, maybe 200 or so. That they either gave to friends or just sort of had, you know, as giveaways. They were very expensive, beautifully um, colored, I'm not colored, some were colored, but they had sort of rotogravure pictures and tissue paper, and they're just wonderful. And I, I found this at a, a bookshelf like 20 years ago and paid almost nothing for it. It was amazing, but I think it's expensive now. But um, but anyhow, it's very well illustrated and it's wonderful peak. And that's what I love about these kind of houses, it's a peek inside a secret world because unless you were admitted to these houses, most of these houses really weren't photographed heavily in magazines and uh, especially this house. So this is the grill to the house. And if you see in the picture here, the grill is in the, in the background with the big palm trees in front of it. Maybe they were placed there for the photo. It seems very difficult to uh, walk around those palm trees, but there's no shortage of palm trees in these houses. They're very sort of like a, uh, you know, orchid plants are today for us, or even those might be out of style by now. Um, but this was the main hall, very surprising for the outside. But like I said, this house was remodeled. I always, uh, whenever I put this up on Facebook or Instagram, it's almost gets, it gets the most hits. It's a really popular staircase. And I think it's a phenomenal view and, and heavily lit by a skylight. And, you know, it just, this says it all. I mean, Mrs. Astor's staircase really was drop dead, but this really just, you know, it's, it's so magical. It's almost like from a Hollywood set. Another sort of very stately dining room, tapestries, and these are the rooms which would be so nice to see in color. Probably in their time, they would have been filled with silver. You see some silver on the sideboards there. Another view of the dining room. Dining rooms, like I said, in those days tended to be on the dark side. Food was considered serious and not frivolous. So you wanted to have sort of like, you know, dark reds and greens and um, this had a small conservatory in this house here. This house I've never seen a floor plan of. I've tried, I look all the time. Uh, I pretty much in my mind had put it together from the photos, which is, that's what I'm good at actually. <laughs> You're taking pictures and figuring out where the rooms go. So I could probably sketch one one day, but I've never seen a real floor plan to it. So anyhow, this came around. This is another reception room, which faced uh, the side street. Then this would be the, the main drawing room, which would have faced Fifth Avenue on the corner. And just imagine this, and um, I would love to colorize all these pictures. It's we do with them sometimes, and I, I do it for my architecture work, and and it's always amazing. But just picture this, like um, you know, any of these gilded rooms that you'd see. And another view of the drawing room, looking again at the staircase. This almost, you can imagine being like a, a Hollywood set. I watch a lot of 1930s and 40s movies on the classic channel and you always have, you know, heiresses and, you know, people walking down staircases <laughs> in gowns and so on. And that whole 1930s look in this house looks like that. Another view of the staircase as we go up it. And then we come up and around and we enter the uh, sec second floor hall. And we can see a, a domed uh, skylight, sort of, you know, reminiscent of what one sees in the Titanic uh, great staircase. This is even a little bit more elaborate, of course, but that's how the interior spaces were lit in most of these houses with, with, with uh, skylit um, entrance holes. Upstairs library. It seems a shame that all the work that goes on being an architect and working on new houses that goes to putting together these houses, assembling antiques and furnishings, whether they're old or new, to you know, last for such a short period of time. And you say, didn't they think about 
what would happen when they went, because oftentimes when these houses were built, they were built by men who, who were older at the time. Most of them weren't building these houses when they were 30 or 40. They were 50s, 60s, sometimes 70s. And, and in those that age, that was even older than today. And I guess they didn't think about um, what would happen. The Frick, the Frick Mansion was designed to be a museum. So Mr. Frick did intend that, which was great. The guest room, looking out into the hallway again. I love this house because I think it's one of the biggest surprises. It's never really photographed. You don't see it in most books. I do recommend a good book, um, The um, Great Houses of New York by Michael Catherines. Uh, there's two volumes of that, and that really does show many of the New York townhouses. And it's, it's I think it's out of print, but certainly you can get it on Amazon. I love this bedroom. It's really just, um, you know, it's ornate, but it still seems like comfortable somewhat. I guess this is what I consider a comfortable house. This I assume was Mr. Solomon's bedroom. Often the men and women had their, their separate bedrooms. A beautiful model bathroom. Sometimes the bathrooms are a little bit spartan, but this is getting a little bit more luxurious. Try a silver mirror. This is Mrs. Um, Mrs. Solomon's suite. And her bedroom. So when Mr. Solomon died in about 1919, the house lingered for a while. The entire contents were sold off. And um, eventually Mrs. Solomon, she decided to sell it to a developer and he um, demolished it. And today it's replaced by the beautiful building of um, 1025th Avenue. Some of the furnishings did go to their uh, New Jersey estate Skylands, which is the uh, New Jersey Botanical Garden now. And um, so partially some of these things still exist, but most have been auctioned off. So we're pretty much done with the uh, these houses. And sadly, it's uh, I've been in some apartments in 1020. They are beautiful themselves. But as people ask, why did it all get torn down? And we're going to hear a few more slides. The um, Well, this is why, because here we see the Vanderbilt house on the left. We have that Mary Mason Jones house on the right. We see all this traffic. and. Uh, and it's not all going one way and somewhat organized, like we'd like to think it is today, but uh, it was a little bit chaos. And uh, so, but it's, you know, streets were actually, you know, filled with people. And, and that's why people didn't want to live there anymore because it was just too chaotic by the 20s. Here we have the, um, the Vanderbilt house here looking like a little, little doll's house castle amongst the skyscrapers, the Plaza Hotel, the, the Sherry building there, the St. Regis. I love this shot. I had seen this like in Lost in New York. Um, it's an old book um, when I must have been like eight years old. And I, I thought it was the most fascinating picture ever. And, and it shows it when it sort of rained over the plaza. But then again, as New York builds up around it, and who knows, 100 years from now, on, we may be having 200 story skyscrapers. Who knows? And um, it's just now you see it, it's a little tiny building. So like I said, Mrs. Vanderbilt had it uh, sold it in the 1920s and it was torn down. And you could clearly see the house uh, to the right was a separate building. But then today, this, this is looking a little bit, even though this view is the 1930s, this is a view we might be a little bit familiar with. The uh, Alexander House to the right is the uh, where the Paris Theater is today. I don't know if it's still there or not. It's there, but that's, we all know it's there. And uh, that's just another skyscraper. So this brings us back to almost a current world. And that's pretty where we leave it. And I just want to let you know, these are some of the sources here, plus uh, from huge collections that I've had over the years and other contrib tri contributors. And if you want some books that I recommend, I recommend going to this here. And please uh, join me on Matches of the Gilded Age on Facebook and Instagram. So I'm um, looking forward to some questions, so thank you. Gary, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> before I start with the questions, I would like uh, to invite people to turn their videos on if uh, they would like to do that. Uh, and if you want to submit a question, you can do so by sending me a direct message on the chat. And uh, let's uh, start with a question about the people who live in those uh, mansions. Um, 
we we assume that those millionaires didn't live in New York City all the time. Do you happen to know how long and when would they have been here? What was the season for them to be in the city? Well, the townhouses were pretty much the fall, maybe into the winter. And they pretty much went somewhere else in the spring, summer, summers for those like the Vanderbilt's Assets was Newport. If some went to the Happens, um, others went to other resorts, the Adirondacks, uh, Lenox. Um, you know, later on, people went to Palm Beach. So, so, so each house pretty much would have had two or three other houses that went with it. So um, I said, you had to be very rich to keep up with all the houses. And many had Long Island estates for weekends. All right. Um, uh, we just got uh, one question that leads to um, a series of questions that we got before. So let's start in a timeline. We know that the gold mansion was uh, replaced a Neo Gothic house that they already own. But what about the other two houses? Did they replace, was, was it an empty lot or did they just replace brownstones? Do you happen to know? Oh, the other the other houses, the Solomon and the Clark House. Yes, I think I think the Clark House may have been um, on empty land. There's actually views of the Clark House um, after it's built of an empty lot across the street of it. And you know, as times with real estate, people would have bought a lot of lots on Fifth Avenue, and maybe nothing was ever built on them because they just wanted a huge amount of money, and even the millionaires wouldn't pay it. And so they, you see many shots of uh, Fifth Avenue lots with billboards and, and you know, messy fences across the street from, from beautiful mansions because the lots were too expensive and nobody would pay for them. Um, so the um, Solomon house was an older house, which, you know, there's some conflicting reports and one, I mean, I've done a lot of research. I like to try to get, you know, the real sources, but as you know, in research is there's so much, you know, conflicting information too. Some say the Solomon house was a new house, but I don't think that's the style of house that would have been built in 1902. That I think is an older house like the Whitney house and it pretty much has been documented in other sources that it was renovated on the inside, which, which you see those interiors wouldn't match that earlier house, so. I see. Um, trying to keep a timeline with those questions. Is there any uh, contact context with the mat, did more mansions get built uh, as a result of the mat or the Metropolitan Museum or we don't see that? Well, the Metropolitan Museum was, um, for those who research in Metropolitan, was a very small museum. And as you, if you go back to the 1880s, you know, it was, I mean, it was a big museum in the 1880s, but it, Metropolitan, as we know, has had numerous wings added onto it over the years, constantly being added onto. The original Met is in there somewhere, it has like a red brick walls. I think it's near a sculpture court. And um, so it, it kept getting added onto. So it wasn't that the, um, if you want to call the March up Fifth Avenue, it was actually written up in the press as two miles of millionaires. It was simply, I mean, the evolution of wealthy families in New York really kind of started down on Lafayette Place, then went to um, Washington Square, then kind of turned the corner to go up Fifth Avenue. So there were houses in Fifth Avenue at 10th Street and gradually it kept marching uptown because just imagine at that time, there was nothing up there. It was just dirt. And so gradually, or they were really s small little wooden type buildings. Some actually, they actually on Fifth Avenue during the heyday, it was a little grocery store that was kind of an old shack actually stuck in the middle of mansions. And, uh, and just like today, when we think of New York, it will ever be done, it's never done. Every time one building gets done, the scaffolding comes down, another building <laughs> gets scaffolding put up and uh, another building's torn down as another one's being built. And that was the, it, it, people, it'd be nice to think if we went, could we go back in time, when would you choose? Well, there would never be one year where everything was just done. It, you know, you'd have to go to the 1890s, 1900, 1910, 1920. Um, yeah, it'd be very busy traveling in time, but I, have, I don't think it'll ever happen, but it'd be nice. But the idea is that the, um, it was the evolution to moving uptown. So by the 1890s, commercialism was coming into Fifth Avenue in the 50s, and then gradually people wanted to be, there was actually a case with the Cotier Mansion. Mr. It was built, not built for, but it was um, Mr. Plant had owned that house. It was a Vanderbilt lot. And then the, um, in time he felt it was too noisy. So there's a story where it's um, 
traded for a pearl necklace from Cartier. And, and then there's other cases where it says no, we'll be given back to Mr. William K. Vanderbilt because he wanted to keep the block residential. But but that's a great legend anyhow. And um, But the idea is that the plants actually then moved up to, I think, into the 80s and built another great house, which I didn't cover tonight. So there was always a kind of like, as, as New York has always been, always moving uptown, you know, so and um, like even with the countryside at Long Island, you went to Roslyn, you went to Westbury, you eventually went out to Huntington. It's always just about moving up and um, and you had empty land to build on. Today, everything gets torn down to build new, so. Yeah. Um, so what do we know about uh, the staff needed to keep those houses going at the time? About the, about the staff? Yeah, uh, I'm assuming well, they, they needed well, a lot of staff. To, um, that's also part of the decline because by the 1920s and the 30s and pretty much World War II, you couldn't really get staff anymore. Um, you know, I'm sure most people are, are familiar with Downton Abbey and that lifestyle, that's a country house, but that's a world where people always ask about these uh, houses as being like homes and they are homes, but in many ways, they were like hotels. If you owned the house, you came there, you walked in the front door, obviously you were let in, and then you went on, and did your things, you went to your room. You know, if you needed water or if a light bulb had burned out or something wasn't right, you just press the button and the staff would come and, and everything was brought to you. So you have to imagine yourself being in like a, you know, a, a perfect, super expensive hotel where you didn't do it. You never went to the kitchen, you never went downstairs unless it was a disaster. And um, so they really were everything had to be done by staff. And you had a lot of people coming from Europe in that age to, um, to work as help. A lot of the English um, and the French and other you know, countries came to work as staff because that was a, a good job to be um, you know, a servant in, in these houses. And then they you know, got their foot in the door and moved on to other things. But the idea, you needed a lot of staff, but there were a lot of people who wanted to be staffed because it, you know, from what you read about the staff, it's like a 24 seven job. But at least you did live in a nice house. You know, obviously the servants' rooms weren't like the bedrooms we saw, but you had a roof over your head. It was heated, and it was a hard job. But you know, it was um, one option. But as different things change in life, factory work and more freedom, because being a servant was a little bit restricted as far as time, people changed. So, um, but you needed a great deal of staff. There's reports of houses needing 30, 40, 50, 100. You know, some of these books you read of the period, they say, oh, Mrs. So and So decided to give a dinner party for a hundred people, you know, within like, you know, an afternoon's notice and her staff was able to pull it off. I mean, a lot of it's fable, who knows, but, um, but they just claimed to show that they had so much staff at hand. And it would be like today where, you know, you type on your computer and say, I'm giving a party for a hundred people, you know, give me, you know, I don't care what it costs, just, you know, just send everything and get everybody and, you know, I'll pay whatever I need because I, I need that restaurant, I need that ballroom or just bring it to the house. And, and that was the way they did. They were proud to say that I can, on a whim, give a party for a hundred people. So, cause you had to have a huge amount of staff to do that. And all these houses were supplied with huge uh, basements and storage rooms. And, but like I said, if you went to the basement of a hotel, it has all pantries, it had plenty of food. And um, so I like to equate them with hotels. So imagine going to a hotel with no staff. I mean, <laughs> you wouldn't get anything done. <laughs> so. That is true. Um, now, when these houses started getting demolished, uh, was there any public effort, specifically for these three houses that we talked about, um, was there any public effort to preserve those houses, to maintain it, or no? Well, a lot of the original people who built them, like I said, they, they were very rich and had millions and millions of dollars. And by uh, about 1914, you had income tax. Imagine a world with no income tax, but when you had millions and you weren't paying taxes, you had even more money, but then income tax came in. So there was a little bit less money. And then the children tended to be um, raised in a world where they just simply lived and they didn't actually really create a fortune. They just lived off a fortune. So if you're just living off of money and not making new money, your, your money is becoming limited, even if you have millions. And, and just like everybody, I mean, if you're um, 50 or 60 years old and, and your parents have passed and, and you have, I'm <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> you have your own life established, you don't wanna move back to your parents' house, even if it's a beautiful mansion, because by that time in the 20s, most people are living in the new apartment buildings that replace the mansion. Because in the Gilded Age, living in a mansion 
was what you did. You didn't live in apartments. I mean, some did, like the Dakota, but people felt a private home was the only way to live. And living in apartments was kind of like uh, you didn't know who was above you or below you, or kind of like it was that silly, but it's the way they felt. But by the 20s, it was fashionable to live in fashionable apartments with a doorman and an apartment staff. And of course, they, those big apartment buildings on Fifth Avenue, some of the original units are huge, almost as great and big as mansions. And they had a lot of servants' rooms and things and so on. So people wanted to, the lifestyle had changed. It was faster. You'd go to Europe quicker on ships, you know, not that people took airplanes, but the idea was a faster life. Living in these houses took a lot of time to get there, set up, have the staff set them up. So, so life moved faster, but like today, I'm, there are a lot of people who could afford houses like that today, but they don't want the, um, they want to go on a plane and go to Paris tomorrow and go to, you know, LA the next day and back and forth. So why do you need a 60 room house? So I'd like a 60 room house. <laughs> 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 <Stay with me. laughs> uh, just, we have so many great questions. I'm not going to be able to go over all of them. So before I go to the last two questions, um, I'm going to, Ask everyone if I didn't get to your question and I still would like a response, uh, feel free to send me an email. I can forward it to Gary. We can figure out a way to to answer those. Are, those are really good questions that we're getting here. So now that you mentioned the 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 houses, the the, the mansions and the apartments. So during the time when mansions were being demolished and apartments were being built, um, were how was the relationship between the people that lived in one and the other? Were the mansion residents accepting of the larger uh, larger apartment buildings? How did how did that work? Well, a lot of the people who lived on, I mean, let's just say you take the um, Alice Vanderbilt house, which is the site of Birdroth today. She probably could have afforded it, but felt like why waste the money on a house she didn't need anymore? And she could, uh, I mean, sometimes they call the downsizing in a sense, she downsized at the George Gould mansion, <laughs> which is kind of funny. And there's another case where Grace Vanderbilt moves to the, the Neuer Gallery, which was a mansion at the time when she has to sell her big Fifth Avenue mansion, which was the, one of the earlier Fifth Avenue mansion. So that was the idea of downsizing. I don't think the, um, the people thought those who lived in apartments were, um, you know, looking down on the mansion owners because they really were the, the same people. They, these were the younger generation that grew up in those mansions and, and they, they also wanted a little bit more anonymity, which is, you know, um, in the apartments where you don't know who's living in them and they were protected by doormen and so on. And so I don't think they, um, I think it was just a matter of evolution. People wanted a easier life. You know, uh, anybody who, who has a house in the country and whether it's a big house or a small house knows it has a lot of uh, needs and living in an apartment, it's like, you know, if you've got a problem, you press the button. <laughs> like so. um, finally, one last question. We talked a lot about transformation uh, from the brownstones for the smallest houses to, to the mansions and when they were the uh, demolished. So based on your expertise uh, of this transformations, uh, where do you think that the most dramatic transformation is happening or will happen in New York City regarding to development? Well, it's actually funny how um, one always feels like, well, if they only had waited, they might have been like reused. And as we saw in the past maybe 20 years, where a lot of the mansions that did survive but became schools and um, other institutions, when, you know, the, you know, let's say new wealth was created. A lot of them were bought by, you know, new money that bought them back to convert convert them into private residences again. A lot of the Upper East Side townhouses are now privately owned. Yes, they may be changing the interiors and so on, but a lot of the townhouses that are around are now becoming private or that were subdivided into apartments. Or many have um, tried to put them back together as as you know whole houses, and um, and we're even seeing that where. Um, and you know, this, the city in the Gilded Age, Fifth Avenue, Riverside Drive, Park Avenue, they were the places where the rich lived. Today, today the rich live everywhere. They live downtown, they live in you know, the West Side and NoHo, SoHo and so on, different lifestyles. But, um, but the idea is the um, pe 
people are still living in grand lies, just a different style. And I think, um, and hopefully through preservation that um, what is left, like I always tell people, while well, a lot of the Fifth Avenue buildings are gone, you can go down any of the side streets on the Upper East Side and between two blocks, still see some beautiful townhouses. And, and that's what's interesting. You look at the facade and you wonder, well, what's behind it, you know, and um, who lived there? And thank God there's a lot of websites where you can go and type in the address and it will tell you it was the house of this person and that. And, Someday I might do a talk to us on the, you know, the, the side streets, which I've like the Pulitzer Mansion, which is an amazing house and um, other houses, which, you know, so yeah, so there's still a lot of mansions left, of course. And, and the reason they got torn down was because, look, it was really about the money. I mean, it's, um, there was those properties on Fifth Avenue were worth so much money. And even Mrs. Vanderbilt, when she tore down, you know, her house, I think she sold it for like $7 million, which was a lot of money in the 1920s. And, and some say she was very lucky because after that you had the depression. And so if she had sold it in 1930, she would have got less money for it. And of course today that, that piece of land is, is worth many millions if not a billion, but you know, um, so it's too bad. Yes, if, if Eric could have held on to land. There was an Astor story where the Astor said, never sell the real estate. And um, eventually they did. But um, if you had the land, you, you always had, um, you know, the value was always there. So um Great, well, um thank you gary uh, okay, thank, thank you everyone uh that joined us this was a wonderful talk as a reminder this is being uh recorded and it will be up on our website if you missed any part if you'd like to share with anyone um it will be up on our website shortly and uh, that's all uh, i see you next time thank you for asking bye. me bye thank you for everyone for coming